You'd be kind enough to do the roll call. Mr. Livingston? Here. Mr. Nath? Here. Mr. Declaw? He called in that he won't be able to attend. Mr. Lennon? Looks like he's running late. Ms. Cimaroli? Here. Mr. Tolmer? Here. Okay. Um, take a motion to adopt uh, minutes from September 28th, uh, 2020 meeting. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, Justine made the motion. I didn't. No, I'll make a motion to, I didn't. to accept. Okay. Um, any discussion, corrections, comments? No. Hearing none, I will uh, uh, call for a vote. All in favor of adopting the minutes, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, minutes are adopted. Um, new business. Um, the uh, long-term flood mitigation plan for McLaughlin Run uh, presented by the borough engineer. Um, I guess what I'd like to do is, is have him do his presentation and then we'll open it up for questions amongst the, um, the uh, council and, and planning commissioners. Um, and once we've had that discussion, then we can open it up for questions from the public, I guess. Okay, John, take it away. Okay, can, can everyone see my screen now? Uh, John, I think I got to stop sharing my screen. So I'm gonna stop oh. sharing and then you take over. Okay. All right. It's all you, John. Let's try this again. How about now? Yep. Yes. yes. Okay. So for those who don't, don't know me, my name is John Heil. I, um, I'm with Lennon Smith Solar Engineering. I've also, I grew up in Scott Township and a lot of you probably saw me running around um, Bridgeville years ago, a um, long time ago. But uh uh, so after the um, flooding in the, pa the past few years, and especially 17 and 18 and the tragedies that we had, the um, Army Corps of Engineers did a, uh, did a study. Um, they uh, released it January of last year. Um, and um, basically the study did, it, was, it, it, it studied um, McLaughlin Run, pr produced a... Um, a, a hydraulic model uh, through HEC, through the HECRAS program, and they and they analyzed a few um, scenarios to uh, you're getting the wrong button here. I'm sorry. Uh, of what could be done to help mitigate some of the flooding. So this what's on the screen now is the, the study area that they they looked at, and they looked at not only McLaughlin Run all the way up through the borough, they also looked at and included in the model a portion of the Chartiers Creek back channel because the back channel has a significant impact on what happens in McLaughlin Run. Um, and I'll explain that a little further here in a few minutes. So uh, a couple of things, they, a couple of the scenarios that they came, came up with with their, al with their alternatives and their conclusion was, one was just a straight structural buyout. Uh, they proposed to buy uh, 16, 16 properties and then, okay, 16 properties are no longer being flooded, basically, because borough would own them, tear them down, and it'd just be uh, open land. Option two um, was dredging the channel all the way up through. Um, this, this, and the, their model indicated this was going to solve 20 um, flooding on 24 structures, not all of them, but 24 structures. They looked at a detention basin up at McLaughlin Run Park. Um, the, the model indicated uh, 20 structures um, not flooding. Um, not sure if I really agreed with that result, but it, that's what their model showed. Um, a couple other things they looked at was um, Bower Hill Road bridge modifications. Um, it doesn't show, in the model, it doesn't show any impacts, but as we all know, with that center pier there, something gets jammed in there and gets caught up by that center pier it causes significant flooding upstream. But the models don't um, analyze um, blocking a, a bridge opening with a car or a dumpster or anything. It assumes just, it, it assumes free flow 
and what the actual structure does itself, how it obstructs the stream. And then the last thing they looked at was um, commercial street bridge replacement, which they, they indicated it would have four um, structures not flooded. Um, so just doing that. So we, we, we took a little bit of a different approach at it. Uh, we reviewed all the scenarios that the core came up with. I dug into the model um, very deeply, um, did a little bit of preliminary um, ransom scenarios, some off the wall scenarios just to see what would happen, some realistic scenarios, and, and was paying attention to what the back channel Chartridge Creek did to impact the uh, stream, what McLaughlin Run itself, how it impacts the stream, and how the different bridges and stuff impact the stream. So I truly understood what was going on before we came up with any alternative scenarios that we were going to actually model. Um, we identified the critical restriction points and um, within the stream. And then, um, and, then I, and then obviously I spoke with uh, the borough staff, um, public works, a number of the uh, um, council members and stuff. We went around, we actually walked, walked the, uh, the McLaughlin Run corridor and looked at a few of the critical areas. So some of the options that we looked at were construction earth and levees to um, keep the water within the stream and no longer flood the, the structures. Um, structural levees, bridge removal and replacements, um, Bower Hill Road Bridge, um, Baldwin Street Bridge, um, commercial street culverts. Um, we also looked at, like I said, some some um, some more, uh, some um, more, well, I don't want to call them off the wall, but some, some scenarios that were a little different. Oh, um, we, we looked at a contr flood control tunnel. Um, Sounds like a great idea, except when we start. When I, as soon as I started looking at it, and I modeled one, it, it, it had some, it had some imp impacts. It did improve. Obviously, there's a significant high cost there. But one of the biggest things I saw with that is when I started evaluating the mine maps and the structures that are above the where this tunnel would have to go. The tunnel would actually be right at the plus or minus the elevation of the mine. So either the mine would be just above the tunnel or just below the tunnel, depending on what portion of that area you were cut, you're drilling through. So it became a non-starter because the safety of the residents above it for uh, mine collapse, as well as if, if, the, if the tunnel was sitting right on top of the mine and the mine roof collapsed, the tunnel would collapse and then it would have to start from scratch. So it, it became a non-starter. And I looked into the detention basin up at McLaughlin Run uh, a little bit more and, and, and determine if there was a way to make that work where it would actually stop the flooding. And the size of that detention basin would be up to three times the size of the ball field area. Again, we don't have that much property, so that became pretty much a non-starter. But while we were doing all this, we were actually working with the borough and we did a bunch of projects already. Got some projects implemented, some projects that are getting ready to start. We're actually going to have a meeting, two meetings tomorrow to kick off two projects. Um, so, but if that we, the, um, the, the restrictions that we truly identified were problems were obviously the Charteris Creek back channel is the first and foremost problem. If the water is not flowing through the back channel, when the water from McLaughlin Run comes to meet it, it's got nowhere to go. So, and the model shows that very well. If you, um, if you would, when you run the model, you'll see that the back channel has a huge effect all the way up and beyond Bower Hill Road. If you would completely eliminate Chartiers Creek, the water surface elevation in McLaughlin Run would drop exponentially, but obviously we can't eliminate the flow from the back channel. Hey, John, um, it's Tim. Can I ask you a question really quickly? Because I think it's yeah. important to the context here. When you say ran the model or we would need three times the size of the existing, what's the, are you assuming it's a, a like, is the 100 year event, the input there? Was it yes. like, what? Okay. Yes. I, I'm sorry. I was going to get to that here shortly, but yeah, no, no the, hundred year, the hundred year model is what we're, we're looking at. Um, two twenty five fifty. we can, we, we can run those. We can see what they do. I was, I wanted to make, use the hundred year model. That is your, I don't want to call it the largest storm event, obviously. There are bigger ones, but that 1% storm, storm event is, that's the one that everyone worries about. That's the one that causes all the damage. So that's the mm -hmm. one we, 
we focused on on this. Um, so the commercial street culvert, you can see the photo here of, of the culvert. And this is what it looked like before we started. The significant uh, impact to the access to the one culvert. So the first one, the first things we did was we got a permit um, for the borough to be able to maintain that culvert moving forward. So whenever sediment starts accumulating in there, all the borough needs to do is call DP, hey, we're going to do some additional maintenance on this culvert per the permit we have in place. They've already done that once. They cleaned it out. It, it, is, it is really flowing well now. Um, Public Works did a great job cleaning that out. Um, the next obst um, obstruction restriction we saw was obviously the um, center column and Bar Hill Road Bridge. This, this, that's, that's the other photo here. That center column really needs to be eliminated to allow the water to properly flow through here because this is, this is the area that catches a lot of the debris. It gets hung up there. And then once that's hung up, everything upstream gets backed up. Um, Baldwin Street Bridge is actually another real significant restriction. It's very narrow. It's not, it needs to be opened up and widened, widened some so that the water can flow through there. Um, because, of its, because of that restriction, the water upstream of it, it, it backs up um, significantly by three feet above the bridge deck. Obviously, what that means is all the water is going to go around the bridge, down Baldwin Street, flood all of Baldwin Street, and, and then fill up there until it can get back into the stream down at Jane Way. Um, and then we also had top topographic limitations here. And obviously we had, the borough is pretty much fully developed in this corridor. Um, don't have a lot of room to move, don't a lot of have a lot of room to truly widen a stream and create a um, more natural stream corridor with that significant impacts to the community, i.e. Um, the elimination of properties, um, which means that's less tax revenue. There's, there's all those implications to it, plus the well as cost of acquiring all those properties. So those are a lot of the uh, restrictions that we had. And then these are the, um, the, the progress to date. I mentioned the commercial street. Another project we just finished was uh, Maple Street Wall. Uh, one of the first things we did when we were going around is we saw the center of that wall had a, it wasn't a nice uniform sweep through there. And it was made with some, with some old gabion baskets that were starting to fail. And there was this basically obstruction halfway around this, this bend you can see in the photo. And it, uh, it created a hydraulic problem in this area, as well as the, the wall was probably, it was about 12 inches shorter than it should have been. So what, we, so what the project was, which was just finished, is we removed that center section, pushed it towards the houses a little bit to get that nice uniform bend through there, um, eliminated all the obstruction below the, right at the base of the wall, and then put, put a uh, concrete cap on top of the wall to raise that elevation. So that, that cap is at the same elevation as the earthen berm across the creek there. And in that area, the 100-year flood it stays within those and those constraints to an extent in the fact that, and we'll get to this in a little bit, the, the, the low end of, the, of Maple Street, there's a ramp that the borough has to get down into the creek to do maintenance when the floods and everything gets locked up. So part of our, one of our, of our options is going to be to address that as well so that water can't just back up that ramp and then back up onto Maple Street. We'll have that eventually, we'll have that resolved with one of the options. But this, this, um, this improvement did have a good impact in this area. It actually lowered the water surface elevation um, tenth to two tenths of a foot, as well as eliminated the, the, the flooding coming around there. Um, mentioned the Chartiers Creek back channel. We are currently working on a permit here. This photo is the one I just took of the sandbar that has formed at the confluence of McLaughlin Run and Chartiers Creek. Um, back channel. The entire back channel is completely filled. It's about three feet high above wa normal water surface elevation. Um, it's a substantial amount of material that's blocking the proper flow of both creeks. So we're getting a per we're working on getting a permit right now to get that out of there and get these creeks flowing correctly. Once they start flowing correctly, that'll help downstream as well as upstream for both because water will flow, velocity gets to where it needs to be, and it'll self-cleaning is what we're trying to get it to do. Um, uh, we also have two projects that are out to, out to bid right now, or actually out to construction. They, uh, we have pre-construction meetings tomorrow. 
Uh, we have the McLaughlin Run Park Flood Control Project. This project's been going on for a long time. Um, previous engineers started the project. We took it over, finished it, got it approved, got permits through DEP, um, the Conservation District. This is going to cons consist of constructing a trash rack in McLaughlin Run up at the park. Um, basically, it's going to be five 18 inch diameter steel caissons that are going to be driven down into the ground. And they're going to be at an angle both to the flow of water and at a skew so that if something comes floating downstream from Upper St. Clair, say it's a dumpster, it's going to hit these, it's going to catch them there before it gets to any of the bridges, and it's going to be deflected into McLaughlin Run Park in the ball field area. Now, as part of this, we're going to lower the ball field area, make it a large floodplain area so it can detain water as well as capture all this debris and hold it until the water subsides. Public works and just roll right in there, grab that material, and haul it away very easily without having it being wedged up underneath a bridge. The other project we're going to construction on tomorrow is, oops, I'm sorry, there we go, is uh, Janeway, the Janeway access ramp. Um, this is right there at Bar, that Bar Hill Road Bridge. The problem here obviously is until we can get that bridge replaced, everything gets, acu um, gets accumulates up against the center column and backs water up. Um, in the past, um, Public Works had to remove the dirt, remove the um, concrete jumbo block wall it's constructed there so they can get a piece of equipment in there to clean it out. Obviously, that takes a larger piece of equipment than Borough has, so it's either a rental or we got to hire someone to do that. So what we're going to do is um, build a concrete ramp down into the stream. The, the, um, the jumbo block wall will, will remain, it'll be reconstructed, but it will remain. But in that section where the ramp is, we're putting a um, removable watertight um, system. And the picture here shows what it looks like. These are basically fiberglass logs that seal together, they're watertight. They, they drop through a, a little um, rack system and Public Works can pick these out with, a, um, with, their, with their backhoe very easily. There's a nice little gadget they use to pick them up and pull them out. Um, it, it'll keep the water in the creek when it floods, but then it allows us to get in there and get everything out of there that accumulates. Um, both McLaughlin Run Park and Janeway, uh, we received grants to do those projects. So those and those projects came in within budget. So they're basically fully funded by the grants that we received, which is great for the borough. Okay, okay bear with me here. It's jumping around on me. Uh, let's see here. Zoom slideshow, previous, previous. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. So we spoke about the, uh, the alternative and options for consideration. The detention basin of, um, adequate area wasn't available. So we kind of threw that one out. The tunnel, concerns with the mines, cost. And then the one other thing that I found in the model is Chartier's Creek, the, the back channel, the elevation and how it floods actually would fill the channel, the, the tunnel, before McLaughlin Run could actually use the tunnel. So that was another problem we were having with it. It really wasn't getting the, uh, the bang for the buck we were hoping for. Um, obviously, the Bar Hill Road Bridge, we definitely need to get that center column removed. Um, Baldwin Street Bridge, we need to either reconstruct or remove that so that that stream channel can open up there a little bit more and allow the water to pass through. Um, and then the Commercial Street Culvert, after we, we evaluated, we got it cleaned out. The... Um, I found that the railroad um, bridge has probably as, as much or if not more impact to the flow of the water than the um, commercial street culvert does just because of how, how low those, those I-beams are. They, they produce the headwaters before it even gets to the commercial street culvert. And since commercial street culvert is so close to them, they're literally butting up against each other. The water doesn't have a chance to come back up before it gets to the culvert. So it's, it's, really doing much to that other than keeping it clean um, isn't going to do a whole lot for, for the project. Um, one thing we do want to remove, do eventually here is, and this is way down the road, won't be part of the, the flood control project, but something we need to do is we need to get the sanitary sewer out of the creek there. Uh, the manholes stick up all the way through that area. There are another, another debris catcher, obviously, and they are hindering flow to an extent. Um, that's obviously a 
going to take some work with Alcasan since it's their sore and that'll be a whole nother conversation under with a whole nother project. Um, so we looked at, we came up with three options that we, 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 we really considered looked at pricing, looked at the, what the model did. Um, option one, um, proposes improvements from the old skating rink all the way up to just past Baldwin street bridge, a little bit of work at Maple street, and then some improvements just upstream of Maple street, um, as well. Uh, what we did is we broke this into three phases. Phase one is from the, the skating rink to commercial street. Phase two is basically from commercial street, Bar Hill road, up to Baldwin Street, and then phase three is from Maple Street up to the end of the imp proposed improvements. So, so for option one, and actually for all three options, phase one of this project is the same. Uh, we actually met with the DEP on this phase of the project already. They're on board with this phase. And what we found was um, the commercial street side of the um, st stream there is above the 100-year 100, the 100 flood elevation. It doesn't flood. Obviously, the side with the borough building, everything, that in the skating ring, that all floods when the, the waters come up. But we don't have a whole lot of room to work there because all the buildings were constructed right along the stream. The bowling alley, the skating rink, and a number of those industrial, industrial buildings there, they're all right up against the stream. So we didn't have a whole lot of room to work with, but we did have some. So what we came up with um, was to construct a soldier beam and lagging levee wall. Um, just north of the roller rink, all the way up to Commercial Street, about 1,100 feet. Um, we're going to do a little bit of uh, storm soar relocation, and I'll show you this in a, pic in, a, in, in a rendering here in a few minutes. And then we're going to install two, two screw pumps to um, keep the, the pump the water out from behind the levee once the uh, for the water that falls from the sky. And I'll explain that a little bit more here in a second as well. And um, this resolves all the flooding of properties along Carroll Avenue. So basically everyone from Commercial Street down to the skating rink should not experience any more flooding unless it's localized flooding for something that, other than the stream coming up. Now the cost for phase one of this is $3.9 million. Um, so here's a, here's, a, here's a rendering of that area. Um, Here's the uh, soldier beam and lagging wall. And as part of this, this green area is actually, we're creating a floodplain area below the wall. So right now, if you go down there, it's a two to one, the one to one slope from the edge of, edge of water straight up to the top. What we're doing is we're going to cut straight down for the soldier beam and lagging wall and then build a shelf there that's anywhere from five to 10 to 15 feet wide that's going to be planted with um, natural stream buffer uh, plantings and gives you a, a larger floodplain. And um, hydraulically, this, this section of the um, project actually has a, be a beneficial impact upstream even, more than, we more than we even anticipated. But like I said, with doing this, all these buildings here uh, will um, sh typically will not experience any flooding unless there's localized flooding. Now to the localized flooding, when we do this, there's two storm sources, one outfall, there's one right here and there's one right here. Actually, there's three, I'm sorry. There is one right here we're getting rid of. We're gonna eliminate this outfall. We're gonna reroute this storm source down to here. We're gonna put Tide Flex anti-flow um, or anti-backflow devices on each of these outfalls. So when, as the stream comes up, the water's not gonna be able to come back up into the storm system and bubble up through the inlets and flood this area that way. Problem with doing that, as it's raining and all this area is collecting water, there's nowhere for this water to go. So in order to get that back into the stream, we're gonna put um, screw pumps. We're gonna put a screw pump in this area here, a screw pump in this area here. They'll have generators with them so that if power goes out, they, they can still run. Um, and I have a picture of what the screw pump looks like. One second here. Not sure where it went. I'll show it to you here shortly. So here's a blow up of that area. So here's the bowling alley. 
Um, so there's a storm sewer that comes right down between the bowling alley and this industrial building here. Um, and then there's another storm sewer that comes down through over here. So we're gonna intercept that, bring it across the back here, tie it in. Here's our screw pump, here's our generator. During normal events, this water is just gonna flow straight through the storm sewer into the stream. Um, when the stream comes up above that pipe, the screw pumps will kick on, pump the water basically up over top of the wall. There's what a screw pump basically looks like. Um, it moves a lot of water very quickly. Um, we'll have a structure at the bottom there, the manhole at deep. The screw pump will come down into it and just it just turns and the blades just pick the water up and we'll just push it over the top of the wall. Um, we'll typically do this before I push this into another little structure that has a, a pipe outlet that sticks outside out the wall. Um, for, for levee purposes, these, this wall is going to sit about three feet above the 100-year flood elevation. That's a requirement of FEMA. So once we get this all done and constructed, we can actually go submit a LOMAR, a letter of map revision to FEMA, and remove all these properties from the, from the, from the flood um, impacted condition their insurance goes, their flood insurance goes down. They won't have to pay those um, large uh, flood insurance prices. I'm sure they've already seen the impacts. It's supposed to be a three tier increase. I think we're still on tier one, um, but a lot of these properties, the um, within the next five to 10 years, their flood insurance will probably cost more than the um, properties are worth. Um, we're gonna, a lot of municipalities are gonna find that they're gonna end up with a lot of vacant land because people aren't gonna be able to pay for the insurance. When they get flooded out, they're not gonna have insurance to fix the property, so they're just gonna walk. So then you're gonna have a vacant land piece of land that the borough is gonna be stuck having to deal with. Okay, phase two. Phase two is from Bower Hill Road up to Baldwin Street. Um, Again, because of restraints of all the buildings that are tight against the stream, Bower Hill Road is right up against the stream. Um, this phase, we can we uh, decided to uh, for this option at least, we decided to continue the old soldier beam and lagging levee walls um, for both both banks. We're going to do it on the uh, left bank, and then we're going to also uh, also do it on the right bank. Now with this, we're going to eliminate the sidewalk along Baldwin Hill Baldwin. No, excuse me, Bower Hill Road. And we're going to re reestablish the, the pedestrian corridor up Baldwin Street and reconnect it into Bower Hill Road at McLaughlin Run. The reason for this is we want to get that a little bit of extra space there for, um, for, the, for the, um, the flood control and establishing a, somewhat of a floodway or a floodplain there in that corridor without having to significantly impact all the businesses and and residential properties that are along Baldwin Street. Um, again, we're going to have um, a, uh, two screw pumps. We're going to replace Bower Hill Road Bridge. This is something obviously we'll have to work with the um, the um, county with because that's a county bridge. But we want to eliminate that center column and um, adjust the that the um, the low uh, rise of the, uh, you know, the, the structure. We also want to replace Baldwin Street Bridge. We want to raise that bridge a foot. We also want to widen that opening a few feet, quite a few feet actually, and get that opening so that the water can actually pass below that bridge without backing up two to three feet. Um, now this this resolves all the stream flooding all the way all the way down to to the uh, confluence from Baldwin Street. This portion of the project is a $15 million um, cost, um, but it, and it does include con condemnation of four properties to, um, to make this happen. And I can show you what those properties are. Let me get this thing to continue to work. There we go. The properties that were gonna be condemned are those three little house houses along Bower Hill Road here. And one actually the one structure that we, we we called as to be condemned is actually i found out just recently had burned down so it's no longer even a, even an issue but we'd have to condemn the property so we could do the work as you can see here here's the new here's the new bridge across baldwin street there's a pedestrian walkway 
Um, we're going to reconstruct Bower Hill Road as well. Um, as a lot of you know, there's been problems with Bower Hill Road. It, it doesn't hold up. The, a lot of that problem is the soils below this road. So we're going to have a significant reconstruction of that road, but we're going to dig down about four feet and get that Play-Doh type soil that's in there out and then bring in a bunch of stone to stabilize that road so they can actually handle the traffic it's getting. Um, and we show uh, the new bridge at Bower Hill Road and the sidewalks are being revised to, to provide access to Bluff Street, but we're not gonna have the access down Bower Hill Road anymore for pedestrians. There'll be, there'll be, sign, oh, there'll be signs to direct them to come down Baldwin Street. Uh, here's Janeway. We have that um, access point built into this model as well. Um, here's the screw pump right at Janeway. We have, and then we have a screw pump just outside, outside this view. And then here's, here's what looks like a close-up of Baldwin Street Bridge. As you can see, all this green area, it doesn't exist as open area for water right now. The, the bridge is literally as wide as those two blue lines. So by doing this, obviously we've been provided a lot more, a lot more room for water to pass underneath this bridge. Um, this is a, this was really telling in the model. Um, in fact, it, it kind of, it, I had a head scratch a few times because the model shows I had a little bit of a post development jump just for like brief second just below this below the bridge. It's not that it's an actual jump, but what's happening is the water is no longer three feet higher on this side than it is on this side of the bridge because it actually can pass under. So it actually sh shows it going level instead of um, three feet higher and then dropping down underneath and doing a hydraulic jump. So it was, it was very telling that this, this bridge is significantly impacting the flow of Milwaukee Run. Okay, phase three. Phase three is about the same for all three options as well. Um, so option, so phase one and phase three are the same for all three options. Um, phase two is where the big part? changes. Yeah. Um, these are, these are like suggestions, right? Yes. Okay. Just check it. That's what... yeah, oh yeah. There's, there's three options for consideration of what we've come up with. We can always, obviously put piecemeal stuff together with this. This is what we've come up that works the best, the most cost effective. I know, I know you're seeing some large numbers. <laughs> I get it. Trust me, <laughs> but cost effectively, they are the most cost effective. Other alternatives gotcha. are a lot, lot larger than those. So phase three, again, phase three is gonna be a, a, a mix of an earthen levy and a soldier beam wall levy, depending on property use and the availability. Um, we're gonna install the, what's called the, the stop log, which is what I was showing you down at Janeway. We're gonna install that, one of those at the end of Maple Street so the water doesn't back up Maple Street anymore. Um, and then this resolves all the flooding all the way up the rest of the way up the stream. Once we do this, basically there's no structures that will be getting flooded typically. And I say that because obviously if a bridge gets blocked up with something, it could still potentially have some flooding. There's no way to control that. Phase three is a $2.5 million project. Phase three, as you can see, here's the little wall we're gonna build across. So here's the wall you saw the picture of. And then we're just going to bring a little bring a little wall across to the large slope right here. Have the little stop wall access, access stop log access point with the existing concrete ramp that goes down into the stream. And again, we're going to provide some floodway in here so the water has somewhere to go um, and flow downstream. A um, couple couple sections just so you can understand. You can see two blue lines. Okay, so this is this is upstream of Baldwin Street. Remember, I mentioned the three foot jump. This line up here, that's the hundred year flood pre development. This is where it's going to be post development. Significantly lower than where the bridge is. Here's 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 um, upstream of Bower Hill Road. Not as much of a impact, but it's still the little triangle on the line, the little dot on the line. That is the hundred year. That is the proposed hundred year. Um, the straight line is the existing. So there's a drop in water surface elevation there. Here's the levee wall you can see protecting all this property. There's no water in here because the water can't get in there anymore. And then here is downstream of Commercial Street. 
same thing. It's about a, about a half a foot of drop to a foot drop. There's the levee wall keeping all these buildings dry. Option two, this went a little bit, we went um, a little different here. So some considerations for some savings. Um, again, as I mentioned, phase one, phase three are the same. Phase two is where the difference is. Um, Bower Hill Roads and, and this portion of the stream here stays about the same as in option one. The big change here is instead of trying to reconstruct Baldwin Street Bridge, which, which is a significant cost, um, we're proposing to put a cul-de-sac here, put a little park at, and have a, a pedestrian bridge here. Now, they, they make a fiberglass pedestrian bridge, which we've installed in a number of communities that can be basically placed by four people. You don't even need a crane to place these. They don't move. They've been tested in um, Squall Run down in Fox Chapel. We have two of them there. And when Squall Run was completely destroyed, the bridges didn't even didn't even show imp, show any um, impact. Um, and then reestablish the pedestrian walkway, and then widen um, the Glockland Run intersection here to provide a right and a left turn lane here, so that people can get in and out of here a little bit better, a little bit more efficiently. Um, so again, phase one. Same as, phase, uh, as option one. Phase two, Soldier Beam Wall on both sides, both sides of McLaughlin Run from Bower Hill Road up to um, um, Baldwin Street. Baldwin Street Bridge gets replaced with a pedestrian, fiberglass pedestrian bridge. We build a cul de sac on Baldwin Street so it's no longer a through street. Um, oops. We install the screw pumps. Um, this, restore, this, this again re resolves all the stream flooding. Cost for this one's 13.2 million. We get to the end here. We're going to show you a comparison of the three options so you can see how the how the numbers change. This one does include condemning six properties. Three of them are those three houses. Fourth one is the one that has recently burned down, and then there's two others right where the call is going to be that'll have to be condemned. Um, so here's, here's what it looks like. Again, this area stays about the same as phase or option one. Um, you can see the, um, improvements of Janeway there, bridge, come down. Here's the cul-de-sac. Here's the bridge. There's a nice blow up. We should have another, I should have another blow up right, whoops, right here. So instead of having this, you can see this big rectangle where the old bridge was, instead of having that huge structure there, you just have this nice little fiberglass walking bridge right here. So there's a lot less obstruction through this area here for the, for the water, which again, this is what causes most of the flooding down Baldwin Street because the water backs up here, flows right through here and then down the road. Um, we figured we could put a nice parkette here with a gazebo. The people can, can sit at they, and it has the interconnection between the business section of Bridgeville and the more residential sections. And phase three, as I mentioned, is the same as for both for all three options. And you can see you can see it's got the same hydraulic impacts as the other. Actually, above Baldwin Street, it gets even more. It's almost like four feet of difference between pre and post. Um, Our hills same, and so is Commercial Street. And then option three. Now this is the one that's more of um, Out of the out of the box, more it's going to have a lot more impact. It's going to have a lot different look. Um, uh, does a lot of good things. Has a lot of uh, negatives to it, uh, but it's for consideration, um, as I indicated, um, phase one is the same, or and phase three are the same as the other two options. Phase two is significantly different. Phase two, we're going to completely eliminate Bower Hill Road from the intersection of Bluff all the way up to McLaughlin Run. Um, so we're going to use that area to, to widen the stream, provide a slope, provide a report, a riparian corridor through there. We're going to build an earthen um, 
levy on the um, Baldwin Street side of this, plantings. You can see all the green areas is basically going to become park area. We're going to reconstruct the intersection at Bower Hill Road and Railroad Street to have a more of a plus intersection, a more functioning intersection. And then we're going to do a roundabout at the, at the, instead of the traffic light at Baldwin Street and McLaughlin Run. Have a little stub for Bower Hill Road just to service those few, um, the church and a few houses that are along there. And then reconnect, reconnect the Bower Hill Road with a, with a different road system. As you can see through this, and I'm just going to blow up in a second here, it's going to have some significant impacts. Um, let's get past this. So as we indicated, so we're going to um, re remove Bower Hill Road from the railroad street, Glockland Run, all the way to um, Glockland Run. We're going to reconfigure the intersection at um, Baldwin Street and at Bower Hill Road. Reconstruct that bridge. That bridge now gets a lot smaller at Bower Hill Road because we're not trying to get Bower Hill Road across it. So it gets much a much smaller structure, which allows us reduces the cost of that bridge, but it also reduces the uh, the impact it has on the, the hydraulics. Um, then obviously we're going to replace Baldwin Street Bridge similarly to what we did in Option One to accept the roundabout that we proposed. Um, this, this, this option gets you a nice vegetated riparian buffer through this corridor instead of the urban um, stream channel that, we're, that we have now and that we would maintain with the other options. The uh, big things with this is one, you're condemning 37 properties. That doesn't, that doesn't um, sit well really with myself, uh, but it's something to consider. And then price of this just for phase two is 16.9 million. So it's a huge cost for this, this, this option. Um, here's a blow up of it. You can see the uh, new intersection and how it would, how it would work. Uh, here's the roundabout. This kind of mimics the master plan that, um, to, to an extent it mimics the master plan that um, EPD came up with. After you do all this, there is a piece of land here that would definitely be redevelopable. It could be um, resold and, and repurposed for commercial use or residential use, whichever the case may be. Um, some of these properties, even though we haven't shown green, you could probably repurpose these parcels as well because they'll be, they won't flood anymore. There's that, there's that intersection at Bower Hill Road. As you can see, this bridge is a lot smaller. There's the old bridge way out here to here. Now it's, it stops here, so you're reducing the amount of bridge there. Um, you're widening the stream through here significantly. The floodplain gets a lot larger here, so we have a lot more area down at the stream for water to be instead of it being up above, so the water surface drops. Oops. And then here's the roundabout. Ties into the alleyway, ties into McLaughlin Run. There's Bower Hill Road will come in like this, and then there's the little road stub. And as you can see, this bridge kind of matches up with the phase one bridge for the most part, or the option one bridge for the most part, other than it'll get, it'll change slightly to allow for the uh, curves for the roundabout. And then obviously this gets rid of the traffic signal there with the roundabout. Um, and then and, and PennDOT would be involved with this because obviously this is their road and they're going to have comments on the significant comments on the roundabout option, but they are promoting roundabouts everywhere. So that they may, they should like that. And phase three is the same. Now here's, here's where the importance comes in. So here's our, here's our options that we've come up with. So option one, again, that has just a refresher. It has replacing Bower Hill Road Bridge. It has replacing Baldwin Street Bridge in, in kind, adjusting them to provide hydraulic opening. Total cost for all three phases is $21.4 million. Four properties get condemned, six stru structures get demolished. Um, option two is the one with the cul-de-sac and the pedestrian bridge. It's $19.6 million. There's six properties condemned with that and six structures demolished. And then 
Option three, which is the um, riparian buffers um, option, it's 23.35 million, um, a good four, 4 million more than option two. 37 properties get condemned, which means no tax revenue from those parcels anymore. 27 structures will be demolished. Um, there's a lot of businesses in option three that would be eliminated that are profitable businesses that I, 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 I personally don't see as a feasible scenario to tear those buildings down. They, um, I mean, there's a number of businesses here that are flourishing. Um, there's a few businesses along here that are flourishing that that this is going to greatly impact. Um, John, do those costs include any of the property? I'm sorry, what was that? Do you're talking about include any of the property acquisition or is it yes. pure? They yes. do. It includes everything. We included the cost for acquisition, um, cost for demolition, construction costs, all inclusive. So, John, I have a question too. Um, yeah. So, either of these plans, option one, two, or three, um, when you're, you mentioned earlier that yeah, you do this and uh, you know the uh, property owner's insurance will go down and won't be considered uh, floodplain. If we did this, would these would this area be taken off a uh, be considered a floodplain, so to speak? Right. What we do is after we get this all. Is there different? Is there different levels? Is like this is level is option one, every you know, are they all the same? All three of these options get us the same result. Nobody, nobody's structure is getting flooded anymore. Of course, some of them is the structures are gone, so that's why they're not getting flooded. But there's no there's no longer any structures through through the corridor getting flooded. So what we do is after we get this constructed, however we end up finding funding to do so. Um, we'll do it with, we'll do the letter of map revision, submit it to FEMA, takes about eight months to get, to get through it with them. Um, I just finished one up in Indiana, PA. Um, once that map's revised, every one of those parcels will no longer show the structures within the floodplain, which means they don't have to pay the increased flood insurance rates. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be required to have flood insurance to get a loan or to, um, or for someone to buy the property. So they don't, if they're not required to buy flood insurance, it's and it's it'll be a significant savings. Um, like I said, a lot of in fact some of these structures along this corridor, the flood insurance will be well above the um, house payments per year. If you pay twelve twelve thousand dollars for um, and then and you're on um, to pay pay for the house every year for your loan. You may be paying fourteen to sixteen thousand dollars in flood insurance when 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 FEMA is all said and done. Yeah, John, you mentioned that three tier insurance plan as if it's a program that's like is it already underway? Those plans? Yes, is, yes, it's okay. in place. Um, they they haven't been real clear. FEMA hasn't been real clear on how and when it's when each tier is going to implement. They had an initial plan and it, they've already deviated from that and. And, I, and I'm sure the federal government has um, kind of weighed in on them a little bit to um, delay it even more with what's happened this year, obviously. Um, but it's it's supposed to raise three times in the next few years. And this just stems back to the fact that for all these years, all these properties along the rivers, along the lakes, along the, the ocean, that keep getting clobbered every year. And FEMA keeps giving them money to... to um, Re rebuild. If you're in a floodplain, you're going to be you're going to pay more than somebody else. And if you're at a high risk floodplain, you're going to pay more than someone that's a low risk of flooding. Instead of everyone just paying a flat rate for flood insurance that just didn't cover it. Um, basically, after New York got flooded, what four years ago? I think it was. FEMA was, for all intents and purposes, out of money for a while there. They they had so much money that I had to fork out to to rebuild New York that they were broke for all broke and. They, they're functioning again, but there's still, every time we have a hurricane, every time we have these big storms, um, FEMA's forking out a lot of money to rebuild. 
Um, so potential funding for this. Um, there are a number of grants out there. Some of them are, um, we are actually getting already. We got close to four, a little over $400,000 from DCED, DCED for the projects we already have underway. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers has a Section 219 infrastructure grant um, that, that pays for large projects. It's not a small project type of grant or larger projects. So is the Section 7001 grant. Neither of them are open right now, but they will be coming open here shortly. One of the things with these those two grants, you have to have a viable project. What that means is you've got to have your permits in place. and You have to have some other um, approvals in place before you can even apply for those grants. FEMA has a mitigation assistance grant out there as well. The FEMA mitigation assistance, you have to have a FEMA approved plan in place before you can get the grant money. So there's obviously legwork that needs to be done before you can go for those couple grants. CFA Act 13 flood mitigation program. Um, this is a more of a local uh, grant funding. Um, we can get numerous CFA Act 13 grants for this project. We have it shown as three phases. It could obviously bro be broken down into 50 phases, whatever we can afford to do and create some of the projects. We can get, um, if we can get $400,000 of Act 13 money for say a section of the wall, we build that section of the wall and that's all we build at that time. Um, CFA also has the PA small water and sewer program funding, which can be applied to this. And they have the H2O um, grants that can be applied to this. DCD also has the uh, infrastructure bank. Now this is a low interest loan and it's for bridges. So this is this is a some funding that we could use towards replacing the two bridges if if that's the cho ch choice the borough makes. Um, then the Allegheny County GEDF grants um, they're currently not open. We've received some money. The borough has grants from them right now actually that we're using. Anticipated schedules for this, just to give you guys a scope. Um, phase one is, is about four months of, engin of final engineering. We have the model basically done. I will ref I'd like to refine that model um, before it goes into the DEP. It'll probably show even more improvements than what we've found so far. Um, it'll be about eight months of permitting and easement acquisition. Basically, that'll happen at the same time. It, it's a 105 small projects with DEP. Like we, like I in, indicated, we've already met with them on that project. They're on board, um, but it is a small project, 105 permit. So it takes eight months for them to review it. Um, to be, if if we do all the, the whole project at once, to be after we get the permit, to be about three months to get it, uh, the construction documents pulled together and it out out to bid and awarded. It'd be about an 18 month construction period. And then like I indicated, it's about 12 months, eight to 12 months to get FEMA to do the low more. Phase two, we don't have any, um, we don't have a detailed survey of this area yet. We do have a detailed survey for the phase one area. So there'd be, <coughs> excuse me, mouth is dry. There'd be about a month of survey work um, 12 months of engineering for all, for all the walls and all, everything we need to do for permitting. Um, this area, it's going to be about 18 months of permitting and easement acquisition. Uh, DEP is going to put us through the ringer to get the permit. Um, and then once, once we get the permits in place, the same three months to get everything out to bid and, and awarded. That phase is about a 36 month construction period. We have three years. Um, Obviously, there'll be shutdowns and reopenings of roads and everything to make that, that all happen. And then, again, it's that same 12 months for the FEMA LOMAR. And then phase three, again, about a month of surveys, four months of engineering. Six, that permit would be pretty quickly. That'll be a small project as well, but that'll be about a six-month process. Same three months for, constru uh, for construction docks. That, that'll only take about a year to complete that whole phase. And then that same 12 months for the FEMA LOMAR. Oops. And that is all the information I have for you right now. It's a lot of information. Um, the, obviously the, the, the costs and the impacts to the 
community with how many properties get condemned is the big considerations on these projects and what character you want. Um, uh, Lennon Smith, we're kind of le leaning to option two, kind of like the making Baldwin Street the pedestrian corridor, um, getting people off of Bower Hill Road, because even though there is a sidewalk there, um, it's not the safest situation because Bower Hill Road is narrow and it is very heavily trafficked. So getting people, out, pedestrians out of there is actually a good thing in that aspect. It has the, the lowest cost overall. And I, I think it, it provides some good amenities for the community. Um, option three would be great if it made sense. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to the rest of our office. Losing 37 properties and the tax revenues available from them just doesn't seem app, um, appetizing. And then option one pretty much keeps the character of the borough as it is for an additional $2 million. John, I got a quick, couple of questions for you. Sure. This is Dale Livingston. Um, phase one goes, or phase one goes up through um, Bower Hill Road, from Bower Hill Road to the skating rink, or, or down to the right the from side. commercial from the from okay. the downstream end of Commercial Street to the skating rink. So you remove the you, you remove that center pier from from Bower Hill Road uh, to help make stuff flow water debris flow through there. What about the, the two con, uh, conduits right behind Dairy Delight? Are they not gonna catch? They will catch, There's no, but, but they, are, they, are, they actually have a wider opening. Those two have a wider opening than Bower Hill Road does. Okay. So, so you basically have two, in fact, if you go down right now, you'll see, you actually have two streams going down through there right now. Water goes through the two culverts. The, the, key, to, the key to keeping those, clear, those functioning is the um, keeping the debris out of the bottom of those? Uh, okay. The debris was extremely high when we when the borough went in there and cleaned it out when we got the permit. They removed over three feet of debris from the bottom of that culvert. Okay. But um, yes, you're right. You're right. There is still a structure there, um, but it's the openings and the, the hydraulic capacity of those two culverts is more than what Bower Hill Road has. Okay, um, next question. Um, th this new um, access at Jane Way. Mm -hmm. um, with, if they put that in, I, and I don't know what the timing for that is, if they put that in before they remove the, the Bower Hill Road, we start getting debris in there, will that, will that new engineered gateway access Will that stand up to the hydraulic pressure of the debris and, and everything else that comes down there? Yes, it's designed to have the hydraulic, it's designed to support the hydraulic pressure for the depth of water we have um, in that corridor. The way it's, the way it's a kind of like a design build for the, for the manufacturer to say, we're gonna have nine feet of water at the 100 year foot elevation. It's a nine foot wide opening. It needs to be able to withstand the, that hydraulic pressure. Okay. And that's how they design it. So what happens is those plastic logs get thicker or thinner depending on the depth of water. Okay. Um, and one last question. It was one that Joe Ver, uh, Verducci asked. Um, do the, do the um, grants require um, match? Match. Some grants require match. Some grants don't. Every, everyone's different. GEDF does not. So the, they're the ones we just got. Help me out here, Joe. Is it four hundred and four hundred twenty-three thousand dollars, if I remember right? Yeah, four hundred and twenty-five thousand for the park flood work, and then a hundred thousand for Bar Hill Road. Yeah, so we have no match to those. All those projects came in under budget, so we're we, no, there's really no cost to the borough for those ones. Okay, but I mean, as far as as it, any of the 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 funding options for. Um, the bigger project here. Right. Uh, where's that? So yeah, so it, it, depending on the project is depending on the um, match. Okay. Most of these have maybe a 15% match. The GEDF doesn't have, does not require a match. And I 
not 100% familiar with the, the core, with the, what their match requirements are. There may not be any match with them either because the way those, those funds work since they're federal, federal, federal monies. Okay. Um, Planning Commission, you got questions? Justine, Mike, Larry? Yeah, I do have some questions and comments. Uh, I guess the first comment is that I'll make, uh, since you all know uh, my relationship with the firm, this is the first I've seen this. So I haven't had any involvement, whatever, with John or anyone else in developing these alternatives or looking at the models or anything else. So it's all new to me. Uh, John, I do have a question on, I mean, you wrote off retention pretty quickly. What is the volume of retention that will be needed to uh, uh, make the existing channel somewhat functional with the 100 year flood? I mean, have you, what is the actual volume required for storage? I never got it to work. So. Oh, I, well, well I mean, you didn't get it to work. I understand you didn't get it to work at the park and that's not a surprise. Right. Uh, but they're so upstream of that. Able, I was never able to come up with a number that would, uh, like a volume that would actually work. So I, I don't have a number for you. Um, would you have like an average capacity of the uh, stream conveyance? How much you can convey? I can provide it. I don't have it. I don't have it readily available. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd like to see that personally. I'd like to see the storm hydrograph. Uh, and the reason I'm asking this is, uh, it, it sounds to me like you didn't look at any potential storage outside the borough. I did not know. We did not look at the storage outside the borough. Well, there's a there's a site that's upstream on McLaughlin Run. It's been talked about a number of times. You are correct, and and, and I, I'm, I'm in I, agreement with you on that. But we didn't look at that as part of this project. I think we need to take a look at that. I mean, that's a very large site. My suspicion is it's going to provide a, a heck of a lot of storage. Whether or not it's enough uh, to attenuate the peak rate of flow and make it more manageable, I don't know, but I really think we need to see that number. The mine elevations, where, do, you, do you actually have what we would consider good mine maps that would give you those elevations? I can download them. I don't have them downloaded, but the key, one of the, the, the real easy way to know where they're at is if you, if you go to Malacan Run Park, the water's crystal clear. As soon as you go right around the bend there, that's where the acid mine's pouring out of the, out of the hillside. That's when the water turns orange. So that's the elevation of, that's the typical elevation of the mine. Well, that's the elevation where the water's coming out. I'm not sure that that's actually, I mean, if you had a portal that you could find there, okay, I can see that, but you know, uh, the mine could be above that, could be below that, and it's just got a lot of static head on it. You know, it could go either, either direction. So I, you know, I I don't know that personally. I'd write off that uh, issue with the mine uh, all that quickly. Uh, you did say something about backwater. You assuming you looked at the tunnel uh, that the uh, backwater elevation at the downstream end of the tunnel was such that it would impede flow. Is that what I understood you to say? Yeah, it, it doesn't get the benefit. It doesn't get the benefit it would if it was a free flowing tunnel. So you don't get free discharge. At the end. You can't, you right. cannot uh, uh, design that tunnel with a slope that you would get free discharge at the downstream end. No, not because of the way the back channel functions. Um, where, where would that outlet at? Um, I looked up, I, I ran, I ran one model where I, so the reason I know how, how this is working is I ran run water with a tunnel that discharged in McLaughlin in McLa actually in McLaughlin run down by the uh, skating rink, and then I ran I ran another one that I it blew the model blew up on me when I tried to get it to work, but I uh, I ran another one that put um put it right right downstream of the CSO at the end of um, Commercial Street. So you didn't look at anything farther downstream? No. 
because you do there uh, there is some elevation advantage there i would think some um uh, ch ch the back channel is relatively flat but there is some yeah you'd, get, you'd gain a, a foot or so what size is that you have any idea what's what diameter that tunnel would need to be um let's see here i think i i had it here i had a model of it let's see if i still do if i have the model open i can tell you Options, planned, planned view, planned view. Open plan. Hmm. Wrong model. What is the problem with the back channel? It's just, it's just so flat that it doesn't flow. Is that what I'm hearing? It it's got multiple problems. One of the primary problems with it is it's the flood control gate at the high end of it does not function. It's where is, where, when you say at the high end, where is that? Here, I'll show you. See, I can show you here on Google. Well, you better zoom in because it's pretty hard to read these slides. Um, it's up above um, the the school the, uh, the high school. Oh, and okay. It uh where, where where it's where it splits. Yeah, where it splits. Yes. There's the there's the gate system there is not functioning and it's not letting water down through to flush out to clean out the back channel. So, so the back channel sediments in. Right. I don't know, Larry, if you were if you saw the picture at the very beginning of the presentation of what the confluence of McLaughlin Run and it and back channel look like right now. There's a three foot island that's got the entire confluence filled in right now. Yeah, I saw that. So let me ask you, who's who's responsible for maintaining it? Well, theoretically, the flood authority is responsible for the back channel itself. Um, before Joe was involved, um, Joe was uh, involved. Um, we were we were trying to we were trying to get some discussions with the flood the flood commit the flood authority to get them to look into doing something and we weren't very successful. Who's the engineer? Is it still Dan Dyser, the engineer there? It's Joe. Yeah, it's Joe Sites. Gateway, gateway, gateway. Does Bridgeville appoint anyone to the board? Yes. Joe Coward, do you know, or does anyone have come to know? We yes, have a we board. That's where my gavel bar. Here we go. Captain Lazio, you guys would do it, Joe. Larry, yes, there's an appointee to the board. Who is it? Uh, I, I believe it's still Joe Mesia. So here's. This is uh Jack. This is the the asphalt plant, Larry. I don't know if you can see the screen. Yep, I can see it. Yeah. This is Jack Cardoni's property. Right. This is this is the uh, back channel right here. That's the back channel there. So. Is there a weir there? Hmm. Yeah. There's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a structure here. What kind of structure is it? Do you know? Not off. Not. I. I don't have. I've. I haven't got my hands on copies of plans yet on it. I'm. Try, I've been trying. I've been trying to find them. That's one of the things I. I would. I am. I would like to put. Push is to get this. Get that thing functioning so this can be cleaned out some. It looks like there's a dam across the channel when you zoom in. Yeah. Looks like, looks, looks like Cognoni's did something. Right there. Right. Yep. Yep. Right up above there a little bit. Right across the main channel. Yeah, it's a it's a that's a little splash pad weir. That's a, like a wall in the you're right. It is a it is a dam. It's it's not a dam dam. It's so the theory is this thing was designed to regulate flow and provide sufficient flow to flush the back channel. Right. And the back channel is probably sediment in sedimented in from you know, from yeah. the beginning to the end. And so it doesn't flow. So how much does that backwater impact this flooding model? So very, very significantly, actually, especially, especially the lower section. So if, if you, you had free discharge, let's just assume that you cut your model off and you dropped into a black hole. 
Mm -hmm. What this, impact would that have on the flooding uh, in McLaughlin Run? It would drop the slower section. Um, just, the, just the lower section. Well, we'll just start with the lower section because that, that part I'm, 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 I'm familiar with, I'm really familiar with is it was dropping it approximately three feet. Um, so and then that, it, that the works its way back the as you work way up. Would the 100 year flood be within Canal Bank? Yes, very, yes, very close, yes. So if they just maintained the free discharge, that flooding in the lower end could be eliminated. And when you say, I'm assuming you mean from like commercial street to the roller rink. Right, yes. All right, so then when and you then move upstream, that, and when you move upstream from there, the next section, what is it that's the controlling factor for flooding there? Is it the Baldwin Street Bridge? Of, the Baldwin Street Bridge. Because it, it, it backs up so high behind it, it backs about three feet above the bridge deck. And that's just that. that's assuming unimpeded flow, right? Right. You're not you're not thinking that there's debris caught on anything. That's just the, the limiting capacity of the bridge, of the bridge owner. Correct. So right. yeah, so it, so the hydraulic model goes about three feet above bridge deck there, which means the water is pouring down Baldwin Street and flooding those properties. So if you replace that bridge, are you able to get sufficient uh, conveyance through there? Can you get an opening big enough to convey the flood? Yes, it, it actually conveys it below the bridge, below the bridge deck without overtopping. It actually water comes straight through there, Larry. The hydraulic line, there's no hydraulic jump anymore. And, yeah, I do and remember seeing that in the model. And there's no no flooding of these properties up up, up towards Maple Street. That's why we don't have so any proposed it, so, through there. So the, clean the channel, replace the bridge. About where does that make a, how far upstream does that make us good to go before we have to do something more to to reduce flooding? Maple Street. That gets you to Maple Street, huh? Mm -hmm. And the only and, thing we got to do it, the only thing we want to do at Maple Street is the uh, at the end of the ramp there, we just got to build one of those uh, log systems so that the water doesn't back up the actual ramp. The um, the wall that's in place is high enough now that it the water the under year doesn't overtop of it even as in current conditions, but it still can back up the ramp. So okay. if we put one of those log systems, the water from backing up the ramp. So now let's talk about from the Maple Street Bridge uh, on up to the park. I mean, we've got that channel that runs behind all those houses. Right. What are we looking at there? Well, for the first three or four lots, it's uh, uh, just an earthen levee. And then from there up to about Coolidge is where the, um, it would just be a smaller soldier beam and lagging wall system. So like a channelization kind of a project. Really. Right. Yeah. It basically, basically the, the soldier beam and lagging wall becomes your levee. Right. You, you set the top of the wall three feet above. What kind the, of bridge are you allowing yourself? Three feet. All right. That's what's required. That's what's required under FEMA for a levee. All right. Cool. Um, So, yeah, I, John, I, I really think we need to take a look at, uh, you know, if we can, what, to what extent can we shave that peak? You know, if we go upstream, uh, if you look on uh, up the clock and run up, I don't know if you remember where coal vent used to be, it's something different now. Right upstream from that, there's a uh, power substation. I think they call it Mosbach Manufacturing if you're on Google Earth now. Block manufacturing. Can right. you zoom in a little bit? Let me see where you are. I'm up at 19, or I'm all the way up to 19. Oh, yeah, you're way up. You're way too far up. Uh, too far up. You're thinking this area right here, aren't you? Uh, I yeah, think that, yes, that's it. There's yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah that area, area, that whole area there, mm -hmm. there's a lot of volume to be had there. Uh, if you do sideline storage and, you know, put the, you know, Define your channel downstream of that. You can back up a fair amount of water. You'd have to do a lot of excavation there, uh, but I think you can get some fairly significant sideline storage. And if you can shave that peak enough, a lot of these other things become much more viable. Now I realize that's in St. Clair, and that's going to be problematic. But I think I really think we need to look at it because right now, I mean, twenty million bucks. 
I mean, that, that's obviously a very huge lift for the borough. Uh, but I think we need to look at these alternatives as a fourth alternative and see what we can do with that. But the whole channelization, I really think we need to dig in on that back channel because that just that bugs the hell out of me. I think we're allowed to, I assume it's been allowed to sediment in, and it's been that way. Now, I don't want to say since I moved to the borough in 77, I can always remember cracks down in that stream there. It just didn't flow real well at all. Mm -mm. Yeah, uh, and that shouldn't be the case. Yeah. If I can say one thing, a couple of things actually. Um, I personally own property across from that Upper St. Clair uh, uh, acreage for sale. And I do have the mine maps because I have, I've had them for about eight years now. Um, not only are you looking at somebody, a, de a developer that owns 21 acres of that property. You're also looking at people or a person that owns three lots at the flattest spot closest to the creek. Bridgeville owns uh, a little bit, I, I forget which, we had discussed it last year when we talked about accessing when Upper St. Clair or the developer wanted to access that property. And build right, we have, a, we have a conservation zone up there. Mm. Right. Correct. Um, so, but again, that, that whole area is undermined. Um, but um, also to the development that's on the top of the hill, and I forget the actual name of the development, does have a retention pond at the creek. They never do anything with it but they consider it a retention pond. And I do believe I still have the drawings for that. So, and that property's up for sale. Those 21 oh, yeah. acres. That, that, that property is basically not developable for a lot of reasons, not right. the least and, of which is they needed to take, take our uh, conservation land to make some of their alternatives work and, you know, we, well, we had that discussion. Presumably, they went away. Well, they're they're they have a different realtor now, so who knows what's going to happen? But so. okay, um, Tim, Mike, you got any questions? Just back on the funding, John. Um, I mean, obviously, these plans start and stop for a borough like Bridgeville with with funding um, experience. I mean, what's, what's the percentage that we could be hopeful about actually getting funded as opposed to like, are we talking about single percentages and, and we've got to do the rest of the lift ourselves or, you know, if we pursue that in the right way, can we get the lion's share of it paid for? I'm not looking to lock you in, just give me a sense of like, is there even something to pursue here? I believe there's, I believe the lines, um, portion of this can be funded through grants and um, some small loans, but most of it, I believe most of it we can get through grants. Like I indicated, we've already, we've received a significant amount just in the past year, just for some, from, for some flood control projects. Mm. We got basically $500,000 last year for flood control projects between Bower Hill Road, McLaughlin Run Park and Janeway. John, do you know what the relationship is between the Corps of Engineers and the Chartier's Water Authority? Sorry, didn't hear a word, Larry. I apologize. Do you know what the, the relationship is between the Corps of Engineers and the and the Flood Authority? I mean, it, who does the Flood Authority answer to, I guess, is the question I'm asking. I think the communities that are, that are associated. Theoretically, the communities that are associated with it. Yeah, but I would tend to think... Do they answer the to the Army Corps. Corps? Yeah, they do answer to the Army Corps. That uh, would have been, know. yeah. And I, I'm just wondering if... Uh, it might be appropriate to get a meeting arranged between them and the Army Corps and, and frankly, raise holy hell about this channel and why they're not maintaining it. I mean, I hate yeah, to I put them in that position, but you know what? People are getting flooded because they're not doing what they need to do is what I'm hearing. Yep. I, I was shocked that the uh, the Corps didn't even look at the um, the Black Channel with their study. I figured they would have looked at that a little bit more than they did. Like I said, they just, well, they they just lopped it off at the channel, right? No, they incorporated like just just above and just below, and they, they plugged in the known elevation for 
Right. Yeah. So, Just to give them themselves a hydraulic point of beginning, really. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it, so it's, it's, it's high to start with. <laughs> well, yeah, and that doesn't work and they probably don't know why it doesn't work. So uh, I, I honestly think that's a discussion that needs to be had. Okay. Um, are there any council members that got questions, comments? Uh, BJ BJ's asked, put a, BJ's put a question asked, out. who maintains the levees and, oops, lost it. Screw pumps, et cetera. S screw pumps, et cetera. Is that the borough or is that? Just screw pumps would be the responsibility of the um, borough. Okay. The levee wall, it'd be basically the, it's not, wouldn't be much maintenance to them. Um, I mean, it's a, steel and concrete structure so yeah, and, and what sort of costs are you looking at for for maintenance with with the screw pumps and generators and um i don't have a solid number right now on it um, okay. obviously we're not because again it, a lot of it a lot of it is driven by the final design of those on what the costs are um I mean, if, if, if it's a very simple system, which is what we'd like to do, the costs are minimal. You, if you do a little maintenance on your diesel generator, and what we've talked about doing is making the diesel generator the primary source, electric and, and um, like Duquesne Light is the secondary. That way they get exercised because one of the problems with generators is they have to fire up and they need to be exercised or they- Yeah. So that's <laughs> one of the things to keep that, to keep that done. So, I mean, the maintenance for a screw pump is, I mean, it's only going to be at $1,000 a year at most. Okay. I mean, Coriopolis have... has three or four of them, correct, Larry? If yes. I remember right? And, yeah. And they've been there for since the 70s, and they're, they're still functioning strong. So do we know the lifespan of a screw pump? I mean, can they, can they say that it's 20 years or longer or... Probably the, quite a bit longer. Yeah, the yeah. screw pumps in Coriopolis are almost 50 years old now. Right. Okay. They're, they're really fairly easy to maintain. There's not a lot to them, really. John, you on that back channel, mm -hmm. do you have a profile all the way down to the main stem? I Is don't, but I have good grade shots at Painter's Run and at McLaughlin Run, so like you get that. You can interpolate, interpolate. But you don't get all the way back down to where it comes into the main channel at the high school. Down there below um, the uh, Cross Creek uh, office building. Yes, basically. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, but 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 I, I can it's get not it. In, they didn't model that. There's no. No. I really think we need to get a couple of elevations in there and just try to resolve the question of if, if that was red, uh, what would that do for us as far as hydraulic grade line uh, where McLaughlin Run enters? Mm -hmm. And see if, in fact, that. You know, the notion that getting free discharge, you see if free discharge is even possible, frankly. Um, Nick asked, asked a couple of questions. One, are the grants uh, reimbursed, reimbursement based? Um, as in, we'd, we'd, pay, we'd pay out the money and then we'd request the money back from the grant? Yeah. Um, Depend, depends what type it is, Sean. Um, the nice thing with the uh, some of the grants now that you have this studied, you can apply for and be eligible for a lot more uh, uh, opportunities. Without having to study, you don't have the opportunity even to apply. So the pool of money that's out there for flooding, once it's been studied, uh, you can apply for a lot more grants. Some of them are reimbursement grants. You get to borrow money up front, and then you get reimbursed on the backside. Other ones are... Um, straight up grant. Okay. Um, and I'm not, not sure. Nick asked another one, and I, and I don't quite totally understand it. Nick, are you? Can you get on and ask a question about the the retention? Yeah. So um, I understand that it's undermined down there past McLaughlin. That that land is for sale. Right. Um, is there a possibility of making that a man-made lake? For a retention pond 
and that solves two pro- two maybe three problems. It creates more of an economy for gaming because it can be used for a gaming station. It gives St. Clair lake houses and it gives us water control. Is that a feasible idea at all? Well, Something that can be looked at. Um, I mean, there'll be there's obviously all kind there's pluses and minuses to all of it. Um, because it'll be in Upper St. Clair, we'd have to get Upper St. Obviously, first and foremost, we'd have to get Upper St. Clair to agree to it. But we need to see if it would actually work and, and actually solve any problems based on the cost of it before we'd um, even introduce it as an option. Yeah, but a more a more direct answer, Nick, is if you if it's already filled with water, there's no retention available. It's got to be empty for it to work. Right, and that's that's where the undermining part would come into place. You know, I mean, you wouldn't completely fill it. Well, I mean, every every gallon of water that's sitting there as a lake is a gallon that's not available for retention, and we're trying to. The tent as much We're as possible. Trying to take away as much water as we can, if in fact it's doable. And I understand the issue with St. Clair, but I mean, I, you know, just let that go for a while. It's the, the first question is, is it even technically feasible? Once you answer Correct. that question, you can start to address some of these other potential issues. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, hey, I got one quick question, Dale. Go ahead, Mike. So all, all your calculations, John, are they based on Upper St. Clair and Bethel Park doing nothing? Yes, it takes the no, it takes the, the, the known flow for the for all the FEMA studies that have been done for Morgan Lachlan Run and just uses that flow and, and runs it through the model. So the if model. they did if Bethel Park or Upper St. Clair did something to mitigate, because they all had they had flooding as well in the past. If they did that, it's like I know, for example, like where um, Outback Steakhouse was, you know, they did, they did a new culvert there. They did some, they did some work. Um, if they did, either community did, uh, you know, having the same type of meetings we are, would that affect our numbers? Or is it, you know, it doesn't make a difference because it's still coming downstream. Unless they're proposing, as Larry's mentioned, a, like a large pond, a pond system, a detention system somewhere upstream, either whether it's right. up in Clarence, we're going to look at or something even up in up in the Beth Park, unless they propose something that's going to significantly hold water back. The only thing they're going to potentially do is they're going to open up a call to get water through faster, which is going to exacerbate downstream problems. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, building bitter, bigger culverts up there just gets the water to us quicker and makes our problem worse. Exactly. That's what I just thought. That's what just wanted to clarify. Okay. Um, any other questions from the planning commission? No, so fine. Okay, Joe, we got uh, public on here. Is there anybody that's got questions, comments? I'm not sure they can unmute themselves. Uh, I know Pat was, Pat <clears throat> de Blasio was on. I don't know if anybody else is on. Pat, you got any questions? I do, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, first, uh, regarding the back channel of Chartier's Creek, uh, I stood there with Joe Mija, not at the 2018 flood, but at the prior at the flood before that. Um, afterwards, I think Mike, you might remember this as well. Joe Mija worked tirelessly to get uh, the uh, the uh, back channel dredged, just the short piece by where McLaughlin Run came into the back channel of Georgia Street. Um, it is my understanding that the back channel is still not part of the Army Corps of Engineers uh, flood, flood and flood control project. And it's also my understanding that the weir has not worked, and that comes from Joe Sides, that the weir has not worked since it was put in. Um, as Larry pointed out, there's not enough flow to remove the sediment. Uh, so I wanted to, to put those pieces out there as far as you know, who's responsible. Um, and uh, we have not obviously dredged it or taken the sediment out of it since that uh, the flood before this, the 2018 flood. Uh, having, having said that, 
done a really interesting, uh, you know, flood control project. Um, my my comment to the planning commission is there's more there's more of a problem in this area than flood control. Flooding is a major problem, but traffic, Baldwin Street, parking, those are also parts of the problem. The, 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 the properties in phase two are impacted by multiple issues. Flooding is just one of them. And I looked at option number one, I, I thought John's comment was perfect. Um, for a little bit more, you can save, you can keep it exactly the way it is, or pretty much, you know, for, for option one. I would hope that we would not want to keep it exactly. There are some improvements, and I thought the, the cul-de-sac was rather interesting. Um, John, did you take a look at all in phase one um, about going through uh, the uh, Soho cement plant? Did you look at that as, a, as an option in phase one? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed something there. Sure. In phase one, rather than screw pumps and levees, and by the way, I think Larry is, you know, obviously, if you could dredge it and eliminate the problem entirely, uh, dredging the back channel. But the on the other side of the railroad tracks is a cement plant. Yes. Did you take a look at just taking the creek through the cement plant? Did not, no. I would encourage you to at least take a look at those elevations. Um, I have mentioned this to Dick Diodori, um, and he is not, he does not object to it being considered. Obviously he would want just compensation, but it might truly improve the, uh, the community as well as being an easy way to solve the problem. Um, the, uh, the third option in phase two certainly seems to provide a better community environment. I and mean, I was curious as to the planning commission's thoughts on the holistic approach to the, uh, to the solution. Anybody? I, I, I think more than the project. You know, I, I, I'm willing to, to look at options. I, I think it would be good to look at options. You know, if there's something different out there that may be better and maybe outside the box. So, I would. So, I, Pat, so, I have a, I'm sorry, Justine, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you go. So I have a question, Pat. So, what's. The, so I'm assuming that Nick Theodore is the owner of Sill Halls, is that right? Uh, Dick Theodore, yes, he is. Okay. And do we have any idea what kind of revenue he's bringing into Bridgeville in regards to taxes and everything? Um, we could have the property tax and the, uh, the other pieces. Joe Cower, I'm sure, could get that for us. Because, I mean, you know, I honestly think that they probably do do contribute to mm -hmm. our financial, to oh. our financial benefit, right? Absolutely, Justine. They, they are a property tax source. They're a, a, a mercantile tax. Yes, right. they do. Um, the question is, would the values of the properties on Street, Liberty Street, would that residential community increase in value if it didn't have a cement plant next to it? Oh, well, I mean, I would think that would have to be taken into consideration. I think all models would have to be considered. So, all right, gotcha. Okay. Mike, are you talking about what, building a whole new channel down through Sill Hall? Yes. Like, a and I'm looking at this on Google Earth. I mean, and, this, and what John was talking about was basically a, you know, a levy wall uh, for the existing channel. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I, I got a sneaking suspicion if you want to do a whole new channel down through Sill Hall, it's going to be fine. I, I can't hear you. You're breaking up, Larry. What I was saying is, I think if you're talking about a whole new channel down through Sill Halls, it's probably going to cost three or four times what the Levy Wall is that John was talking about. Because yeah, I mean, that's I a long that. distance. I mean, I mean, the only thing you really avoid is the Commercial Street Bridge, frankly. And oh. you've got a 90 degree bend you got to make there. Uh, kind of hard, yeah. to, in my mind, to imagine that's going to be cheaper than what John's already talking about. Truthfully, you got a ver you got a, a high vertical slope at, uh, right next next to the railroad when you once you get past the plant. Right. Remember that you eliminate the railroad bridge and the culvert. Both of them are eliminated. Yeah, but I'm not hearing that those two are, are critical hydraulic structures. Are they, John? No, those two aren't. The, those aren't the critical hydraulic structures. No, I don't think so. The, the, the Bower Hill Road bridge is the only critical one, right? Again, I don't know. I don't have any engineering. That's why I was asking John if he took a look at it or what the thoughts were. And I guess, Larry, you're telling me right now, you know, it's. I mean, you can run the numbers. I, I guess think in suspicion it's not going to be competitive at all. Yeah, I think you, I think the earthworks alone will be well over the cost of the others. I mean, and I don't know how you would, I mean, just compensation for that property, that's going to be a lot of money. <laughs> Okay. I was I was pulling back from the just compensation piece. My question to, to John was, what does the engineering look like? And to be honest with you, from my layman's point of view, it's could you just you know dig it out a little bit and it just flows down through that property? I don't have any idea what the elevations are. No. Yeah. Not an idea? Then scratch it off the list. Okay. Mike, I was, I was just going to say for as much money as we're proposing, you know, to look at something like that would, you know, would probably be, you know, at least take a look at it. But, you know, but Larry just answered our question. So okay. my point's moot. Okay. I, mean, I don't want to discourage John from doing the cost estimate. It's just that it's hard for me to imagine that's going to be cheaper than basically, what is it, phase one, John? Is that what you called it? Yeah. I just I just ran a really stu a stupid ballpark number just from the length. I took the length from the from Bowery Hill Road to where it would it would tie in below the, the train trestle. It's it's two it's over two thousand feet. You go ten by twenty by two thousand. You're, you're looking at over ten thousand ten million dollars and just just to move in a, just to cut a channel. Not to mention moving the hillside that has to be moved. As compared to would you say three million? Yeah. Okay. Pat, you got anything else? I'm going to try and wrap this up. Uh, Joe, is there anybody else from the public out there? It's good. Okay. Not that I'm aware of, Dale. Okay. Um, thank you, John. Yep, not a problem. Um, to to dr address uh, old business, I guess I would take a motion to uh, table the three items that we have for old business until the uh, November, December meeting. I second that. I, I have a question before you do that. The chicken okay. keeping, what's, what's the status of that? Um, Joe distributed a draft of the ordinance. Oh, um, I must have missed last, that. Last Thursday with, with all the other information for tonight's meeting. It was all in the same packet, Larry. Yeah. All right, I'm going to have to go look because I completely missed that. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I, I would I would take a motion to uh, table all three of those issues. One other question, if I can, Dale, before that, that motion gets made. So I think I saw, just keep me honest here, Joe, we've got We've got our foot in the door for budget for 21 for the comprehensive plan, right? I think we went for 50% of it. Yes. Okay. And then on the, the pedestrian safety, just want to make sure we don't lose a window here with 21 budget requests. Uh, back to you, Dale. I know I missed last month, but anything that we need to get in with any sense of urgency or are we 
good with the 50% on the plan. And that's what we're asking for this year. Dale, I could, I could give an update if it's helpful. Looks like we might have just lost Dale. He was frozen in time there for a second. <laughs> uh, Tim, what's going on? We have a proposed budget that's uh, already been circulated to the Council Finance Committee that's uh, balanced for next year without a tax increase. Uh, there is money in place for year one of a phased comprehensive plan. So $25,000 is penciled in the budget. Okay. Uh, Finance committee was okay with it. Council will have their first budget meeting on November 2nd. So hopefully we'll, I'll have a concrete answer then, but right now everything's looking very favorable. Uh, okay. The signed budget within the public works department was increased about to $6,000. That does start phasing in some of the uh, signage improvements for pedestrian signage. And we can even start doing some welcome signage. So it, it's a start. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So pretty much everything that we've heard at planning commission meetings have been addressed throughout the year uh, within the proposed budget. Good. Sorry, my signal dropped out. I, I missed a lot of that. Um. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> I was just asking for anything that we need to get our, our requests in for budget for 21. Are we good? Joe confirmed uh, okay. very succinctly that we are. Okay. So I'll take a motion to, to table the old business until the the November, November, December meeting, which is- I'll make a motion. I'll second, I'll second. Oh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Tim, Tim made the motion, Justine second. Um, and this is to table the, the 2021 budget, the chicken keeping and the pedestrian safety issues um, until the next meeting. Um, any further discussion? Um, Dale, this is Joe Cower here. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, Instead of having separate attachments for each one of these uh, uh, agenda items, the packet was one PDF file that had everything there. So just keep scrolling to that PDF and you'll see everything right. in order. Right, right. But I, I would, I would, the motion to table the discussion and stuff till, till next meeting. And then the only other thing before you vote on it, just as an update, that active Allegheny grant uh, this has been talked around for a couple of months. The deadline to apply for that is middle of November. So it's going to be before your next meeting. Uh, I did prepare a grant application seeking money to do an active transportation plan uh, through that grant source. Uh, it will be on the council agenda because there's a resolution that needs uh, adopted by council before we submit it. So hopefully when we come back at December, November, uh, that's going to be off your agenda and submitted. And hopefully we just wait to see if it was how it's determined. Is there anything that we need to do to take action on that tonight? No, no, no. Everything uh, okay. you've guys been doing all year led up to that grant application. Okay. So okay. All those uh, slides that went over the need for pedestrian safety and uh, traffic mitigation work, uh, those were the footprints for that grant application. And, and they're being included with that application, including the that report from the police chief on all the pedestrian accidents. So it, it basically all the discussions we had this year uh, – were the foundation and, and actually got put to work. Okay. Right. Okay. So I got a motion and a second to table the rest of the, dis the discussion of the old business till next meeting. All in favor sig signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, I'll take a, take a motion to adjourn. I'll second. Somebody want to make the motion? Or yeah, when you say motion. I'll take, I think everybody thinks you're saying I will make. So, oh, sorry. I'll, <laughs> I'll make a motion. I'll second it. There you any, go. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, by, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you all. And thank I, you, Dale. I, thank um, you, John. Thank you, John. I pronounce the meeting adjourned.